here. How many of you work for a living? Uh, <laughs> I would think, and the rest of you are students who want to work for a living, right? Um, how many of you uh, expect that you may retire someday? A lot of staff and not many faculty. Uh, <laughs> we just keep going and going and, and going. Well, I'd, I'd like you to engage in a, in a mental exercise for a few minutes that I think you'll, you'll find um, powerful. Imagine for a moment that you are there on the day of your retirement, that um, you have traversed this, uh, th this journey that uh, we call the nine to five life and the time has come for you and for all the others in your cohort who are retiring to, uh, to have a party. Been to a retirement party? It could be a lot of fun. Um, I'd like you to put yourself there mentally. Project yourself into the future. Look around. Where, where is this place? And, and who's there? People are coming up to you, shaking your hand, giving you a hug, patting you on the back, smiling, giving you a kiss. From across the room, people are talking to one another, pointing at you, waving, smiling. A lot of people are talking about you tonight because this is your night. And eventually, people start coming up to give speeches about the retirees. They, uh, you know, some of them are humorous, and some of them are poignant and touching, and some of them are merely polite. Not a lot to say about that person. But eventually, somebody gets up to talk about you. Okay, who's that person? Is it a colleague? Is it a boss? Is it an employee? A student? A client? And what will they say? What will they say about you that, that mattered most in your work life? What was your greatest contribution? Now, really, think about that for a second. Don't, don't do what I do when I'm sitting in your seat, which is, yeah, yeah, pastor, okay, what's the point? And I, I just skip over the whole mental exercise. Don't sell yourself short here, because this works. Put yourself in that place. Where is it? Do you see the place? Do you see the person? Do you know the time? <laughs> Do you hear what they're saying about you that mattered most in your work life? Okay, you there with me? Take this one step further now. Imagine that the person with the microphone is not a colleague, is not a, uh, a boss or uh, an employee, not a student, but Jesus Christ himself. And he sits down. Instead of standing there with the microphone, he sits down and right next to you and he says your name and he smiles and he says your name again. And he gets up and he says, I want to tell you all what this servant of mine did with all of these years that mattered the most. That's sort of the southern Jesus, the, the Judah Jesus. So I'll tell you all what he did that mattered the most. All right? And you sit in awe listening to what's chronicled over the next several minutes. And you're in awe at just how different this speech is from all the rest. At how different Jesus' definition of success is from everybody else's definition of success. What would he say? What would he say about you that really mattered the most? What would he emphasize? Well, we can be reasonably sure of what he would not say. He wouldn't talk about the title that you earned. He wouldn't talk about um, you know, what's on your business card or the size of your office. He certainly wouldn't be talking about the, the, you know, the size of your paycheck or things like that. Uh, he probably wouldn't talk about how many emails you sent or read. Or the, and, and in fact, um, I'm, if I have my hermeneutics right, I'm reasonably sure he wouldn't uh, emphasize primarily our productivity either. Although stewardship is very important, I don't think that he would talk first and foremost about what we achieved on the job, about how many papers we wrote or how many reports we wrote or how many, uh, how many things we actually produced. He probably wouldn't talk initially about our innovation, how we move the organ organization forward. Again, although these things are important, I don't think that this is what Jesus would say mattered the most in our work. Instead, I think that what he'd emphasize are more the invisible, intangible, sometimes visible to only a few people things, the relational things, the things that have to do with service to others. What is success in God's eyes? I think it's the great commandment. 
I think he would say that this servant of mine loved God with all of his heart, soul, and mind and loved his neighbor as himself at work. I think it's the fruit of the Spirit. I think he would say this servant of mine was loving and was joyful and peaceful at work and was patient and kind and generous and faithful, gentle and self-controlled in adversity. I think he would uh, emphasize the Beatitudes. And I think he would emphasize some other virtues like we see in Colossians 3. My servant was humble. My servant was compassionate. My servant was forgiving. That's what mattered in her work life. I think he might even cite Proverbs 16. Commit to the Lord whatever you do and your plans will succeed. He worked at everything as working for the Lord. That was his motivation. It wasn't the pay. It wasn't the prestige. It wasn't to impress people. But he was working for my father. Ultimately, I think that Jesus would emphasize Romans 12. The servant of mine operated out of a renewed mind. It was a living sacrifice on the job. I think these are God's definitions of success. I think these are the things that matter most in what we do here at Regent University. And as I look around this campus, and as I have over the last five years that I've been here, I've seen a lot of people who are successful in God's eyes, a lot. It's so encouraging to be here and to be around spiritually mature people like this. And I see them at all levels of the organization, from the top to the bottom. And I see them across all schools, or at least most schools. No, all schools. <laughs> and it's, it's truly gratifying to be here. And, but notice the, the point here. It's that the custodian could be as successful as the vice president. Amen? that the administrative support person could be as successful as a world-renowned faculty member. Amen? In God's economy, everything is different. And we need to be reminding one another of this. We need to be reminding ourselves of this when we feel like we're kind of in a dead-end job or nobody cares or we're not being thanked or this is a mundane task. You ever feel that way? I know I have at times. We need to remind ourselves that... We are being successful even though nobody is seeing what we're doing or even though one person is seeing what we're doing. That it's, it matters just as much to God as the accreditation or the book that got published or any of the other tangible things that we, we typically associate with success. You know, success in God's eyes, what matters most to, um, to Jesus is that we are Christ-like from nine to five. Right? Right. You, well, you know, I'm seeing a lot of nods. I'm seeing a lot of smiles. And quite frankly, my guess is that I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. Is that true? You've heard this before. Some of you have taught on this before. Some of you have written on this before. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. So I guess the next question is, what's the problem? <laughs> I ask myself this question all the time. Boy, you are a real hypocrite. You write on this stuff, and then you turn around, and you fall into the same trap. What is the pro Why is it that we get caught up thinking about this other definition of success and responding to those incentives? All right? This is a critically important question. Why is it that we can't be consistently Christ-like on the job? Why is it that we, we can't do the things that Jesus would want us to do each and every day? It's a big question. It's a question that goes far beyond anything that we can do in 15 or 20 minutes here. And uh, really, that, that's the purpose of providing you with this resource on your way out the door. It's a book called Faith at Work, Overcoming the Obstacles to Being Like Christ in the Workplace. There are a lot of obstacles, aren't there? A lot of inhibitors, a lot of things that, uh, that prevent us from being authentically, consistently Christian throughout our workday, even here at Regent. A lot of those obstacles are internal. You know, our pride, our ambition, our impatience with people, our fear of, of persecution or our fear of, you know, being demoted or not being liked or something like that, our lack of compassion for people. 
you know, something called compassion fatigue. We just get tired of loving people, just get tired of caring about people, right? Our refusal to be meek, our dislike of our job, um, external obstacles as well, some things in the corporate culture, you know, maybe a constrained budget doesn't permit you to, uh, to do the kinds of things that you would like to do for your employees, right? Um, many, many obstacles. And I would like you, if you, uh, if you choose to take one of these books on your way out, uh, I'd like you to read it. <laughs> I'd like you to, uh, or, or at least begin to read it or consider reading it. And if you're not going to read it, then pass it on to somebody else who will read it because it's, it's my hope that, um, that through reading it, you will come to a better understanding of why there's a gap between who we are and who God wants us to be. And it's only through understanding these obstacles, only through seeing them clearly, that we are better able to co-labor with God to overcome those obstacles and to be more consistently Christ-like, to be more authentic in our, our workplace witness, to be more successful in God's eyes. So, uh, yeah, we, we don't have the, the time to go through all of those, but I, I do hope that uh, you'll take that as a token of uh, our, our appreciation to you and as um, sort of an extension of, of this message this morning. Um, I'm just going to close this up with a couple other action items. Don't think of them as homework, please. It's the wrong metaphor here. This is an invitation to, uh, to go the next step. You know, besides just reading some of this, this stuff, besides uh, just sitting here passively listening, um, I would invite you this afternoon to really reflect on what you do and why you do it. Think about how you think. Think about what you're thinking about on the job. Sit there and watch yourself. What kind of incentives are you responding to? What is it that's motivating you? What is it that you're really considering to be success? Why are you engaging in these particular activities rather than other activities? Right? Th through introspection, a, a lot of the battle is won. Right? Prayerfully consider what it is that you're doing this afternoon and why you're doing it and whether that comports with God's definition of success or if you're responding more to the world's definition of success. So that, that's certainly one thing that we can do. Another thing y you might want to consider is putting something in your workspace to remind you of God's definition of success. And here I am telling you that I'm a hypocrite because <laughs> I teach this stuff, I write about this stuff, I think about this stuff, and I fall flat on Monday morning. Why? Because I don't have something in front of me to remind me. I've forgotten somehow. Other things have encroached on my mind, and God has gotten crowded out. Don't let that happen. Put things around you that remind you of what real success is. Write out the fruit of the Spirit. You know, print out some, some Bible verses and put those right there on your computer monitor or wherever your workspace is, all right? And remind other people of why we're really here, of what success really means, and encourage one another when we see people responding to God's incentives. And lastly, if you really want to make this powerful, if you really want to nail this, follow through on this mental exercise, before this grows cold, sometime this afternoon, jot down a little outline of what you would like Jesus Christ to say at your retirement dinner. If you really reflect on that, even for just five minutes, and ask God to work through you and through your, your pen or through your word processor there, and to type out just four, five, six things that you believe matter the most to Jesus in your work life, I think you'll be amazed. It's a general success principle of beginning with the end in mind, isn't it? I mean, that, that came along long before uh, Stephen Covey reminded us of that. Begin with the end in mind, right? Begin today with the retirement dinner in mind. Begin today with that outline of what you would like Jesus to say upon retirement, all right? And in doing so, I suspect that each one of us in this room is going to be a lot more likely to please God, to have a God-honoring legacy, indeed to 
have Jesus smile at us at that retirement dinner and say, well done, my good and faithful servant.